Uh, I will just go ahead with our first uh, local speaker, and that is uh, Professor Søren Bronak from uh, University of Copenhagen, the Center for Protein Research. And uh, we're very happy to welcome you here on stage, and I will just put up your, um, your, um, your talk. Oh, wait a minute. Just one second. And you can go ahead yeah, thank whenever you you're much. ready. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, and and um, thank you, Morten, also, and to the other organizers for the uh, invitation. So this is um, an um, in silico talk. Uh, we're interested in uh, lifelong disease trajectories. How do diseases follow one another? And we use um, large data sets with millions of patients. And, and uh, the idea is to to try to, to uh, see whether we can stratify a whole population into subgroups of frequently occurring disease um, correlations. So you see this slide here uh, with, with diseases on the different axes. Of course, we have thousands of, of diagnoses that you can visit during your uh, lifespan. Uh, most of us start out um, uh, reasonably clean in, 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 in the middle of, of this coordinate system, and then we, we take a journey, and, and of course when we have data for, for example, 7 million people, we have 7 million individual trajectories, and, and uh, in some of our work we try to condense it into seeing what are the frequent uh, ones that, that actually might also be useful in, in precision medicine context, of course. These trajectories, they are influenced by germline genetics, by exposures, by treatment. There are also many treatment-provoked uh, diseases, and we're interested in, in, um, in those. If you have cancer and you get chemotherapy, then you will get some diseases later that you would not uh, get likely if you got surgery and so on. So, so the treatment-provoked component in disease trajectories is also interesting. So in, in principle, we look at all diseases across the full spectrum. So we, we are actually uh, mostly molecular level people. We are interested in disease etiology and we look for genes and protein complexes and so on that will uh, explain, for example, why two diseases follow one another or, or why they co-occur in a lot of, of, of patients. But this work has also been further motivated by the fact that um, the human genome contain so few protein coding genes. Originally, people thought humans had millions of, of genes, actually six, seven uh, million. That was before the discovery of the intron, so um, people thought that the human genes were uh, same length as the bacterial genes. Um, but when the Human Genome Project started, it, it got down to around um, 150,000 in terms of, of, um, of estimate. Um, but now we are, we are looking at around 20,000 protein coding genes, of course, in addition to some RNA and uncoding RNA genes and so on. But, but, but it's clear that many of these genes are involved in more than one disease, and we are likely to have a lot of pleiotropy where variation in one gene will drive several uh, diseases and their uh, co occurrence. But of course, many disease co occurrences will also be sort of comorbidities that are follow on, on um, diseases. So, so we are also, I will not talk so much at, at, at the, uh, about the gene level today. But actually, it's interesting, this is from a paper we, we um, published together with the, the um, Illuminating the Druggable Genome uh, Consortium a, a few years ago, where we looked at how many genes had actually been linked to, to function. And, and, and it's still uh, around one-third that is not uh, studied. And it may be a possibility that many of these genes link to several diseases so that they are difficult to, to single out in, um, in, in, in these studies. So this type of work, uh, I mean, we work on human data, 
and, and it, it's sort of part of a trend um, that people call humans as model organisms. Of course, we, we know that it might be difficult to transfer results from mice or rats into the human situation. Here we work on uh, patient record data from humans and experiments with humans, uh, drugs that humans took. So, so, so we are in, in some sense treating humans as a, as a model organism and this is the, the, uh, the consent. So here's another um, figure from a, from a review we wrote or published a few years ago. And it's clear that you, you have some, some healthy situation and then you have disease progression and eventually you have disease uh, occurrence and you have disease co-occurrence in the other end. And while people thought with the Human Genome Project that, that we could understand many of these disease risks and disease co-occurrences just from looking at the molecular level data, it's now clear that we need the clinical data, uh, full speed and also deep uh, uh, clinical data to actually understand uh, the molecular level. So we work sort of from both sides, from the molecular end, but also from the clinical uh, data. Another um, statement I will make is that uh, when we look at biomarkers, um, they have also gone disease spectrum wide in some sense. When you sequence somebody's genome, this is a figure from uh, uh, the Danish uh, reference genome publication that we published a few years um, uh, ago, and this is one particular person. Um, uh, but, but when we sequence somebody's genome, we get biomarkers across all diseases that, that have a genetic link. And, and it's also similar when you do pro clinical proteomics experiments, you get pr protein profiles that actually may be used to disentangle many different diseases. So we're not just looking for one biomarker anymore, but, but essentially uh, sort of in a, in a more holistic way, uh, many. Um, and, and, and that is also supportive of trying to, to look at disease correlations in a lifelong perspective uh, across the full spectrum of, of, of disease. But back to the patient records, um, uh, we, we work with all these states. I will mostly talk about diagnosis today, but these trajectories can of course also be prescription trajectories, they can be lab value trajectories, and, and you, can, you can look at many different types of longitudinal patterns in these data that you find in, in, in patient records. And you can of course also combine them. Also text mining of the text, we do a lot of that as you may see in some of the papers we have published. I will not talk so much about that today because it's the, the, the main idea of making uh, longitudinal um, analysis of, 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 um, of diagnosis. So uh, the Scandinavian countries are generally good for this kind of work because we are not th uh, throwing data away that much at least and, and, and we are quite digital. We got in Denmark our social security number in 1968. So all these healthcare events they have been tagged with the same number so that we can stitch them uh, together. Here you see uh, a, um, a listing of, of um, how uh, the adoption rates for e-health e is across countries. And, and the yellow countries here, they have sort of a one-payer system like we have in, in Denmark. In this, you of course always try to look for statistics where your own country is coming out in, in, the, in the top. Uh, but, but the Scandinavian countries are generally uh, good um, countries to perform this kind of, of lifelong data uh, analysis of these, um, uh, of these trajectories. And, and that the idea again is of course to try to see when we look at, at millions of trajectories, uh, can we find the most frequent ones and essentially stratify uh, patients in this way. We should also remember, and this is also of increasing interest in this whole area, um, not just to look at the lifespan where we have many diseases, but also look at our healthy lifespan. So, so we have projects where we wor work on blood donor data, for example. That's the green part, part to the left of this slide where we have measurements where, 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 where the uh, individual is, is reasonably healthy. And then of course, when the individual uh, uh, retired blood donor eventually gets sick, you can go back and look at some of these biomarkers also in the, in the wet lab samples. But this disease trajectory analysis should of course eventually 
uh, go from from uh, day day one to uh, and maybe day mi minus uh, a lot of days <laughs> to, um, uh, to to the end of life. So, but in this talk, uh, we're just working with diagnosis and we use the ICD-10 system uh, that WHO organizes with all the different colored uh, chapters. And um, uh, in Denmark, it looks like this. Uh, there are different versions of uh, ICD-10. In Denmark, we shifted from ICD-8 to ICD-10 in, in, um, in 1994, and we will actually quite soon switch to ICD-11. Uh, and you see the prevalences. So it, 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 it's not because the Danes suddenly in, uh, in 98 became much more sick. Uh, it's because there are more codes, there are 20,000 level 3 codes in, in ICD-10 and, and um, uh, 8,500 in ICD-8. And, and if you want to model over such a 40-year period, you, you can try to map ICD-8 to ICD-10 and, and, and then see whether you can do that. Most of the work I will describe today has just been done on the ICD-10 uh, period where we have around uh, 7 million Danes. If we have the 40-year period, we, we, um, we have 9.5 million. In both cases, of course, a fair share of these patients are dead, so the sort of end-of-life situation is, um, is, is covered well. So these registries, uh, for example, the Danish National um, Patient Registry, you see here with the green line, it's sort of these uh, more than 40 years, and also the Danish Register for Causes of Death, uh, same um, length. But then we have all these other registries, uh, pre uh, prescription registries. We also have raw patient record data sets that I will not talk so much about today, but we are allowed in the permissions we have to actually take, for example, a patient record data set and then uh, sort of pad it with registry data so that we also, for the deep data, can, can, can look at it in, in longer. Uh, time spans. And of course, in Denmark, we also have a good multi-generation registry that also is being improved, but, but we also have the family relations and, and can look at least to some extent for, for uh, diseases that, that uh, also co-occur across generations and, and might be uh, inherited. So the basic uh, idea here is to make trajectories, linear trajectories. And this is different from disease co-occurrence. Very often you look at a comorbidity score and then people just take some diseases that the patients have for some Charlson um, score and then you, you, you compute a number. Here we are interested in, in diseases where disease A is before, at least in a statistically significant way, before disease B and before disease uh, C. So we have a statistical way of looking at these statistically significant directional pairs where there is a disease progression patterns. That's what we are interested in. It's not a guarantee that these statistically significant progression patterns will be causal, that one disease will actually be causal for the next, but at least it's a good starting point when you have something that has a statistically significant direction. So we compute these trajectories with diagnosis, and, and you see that, that you also quickly run out of patients. I mean, Seven million patients sounds like a lot, but when, it, when a patient should have had this disease and this disease and this disease, you quickly run out of patients. And then you can summarize as a, as a network um, like, like this, and, and from this early paper, this is how it looked with, with, with diabetes. Here's another one with, with depression. Very complicated, you can be, uh, become depressed, uh, depressed in many different ways. It's actually the same with, 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 um, with diabetes. Here's another one with, with epilepsy. So we have focused on a lot of different disease uh, areas, and I will focus a little later a little bit more on dementia. Um, here's a paper uh, from two years ago um, on, on, on cancer. When you get your first cancer diagnosis out to the left for different cancers, which uh, diseases are, are statistically significantly occurring before you get your first cancer the diagnosis. Again, some of this might be causal, some might just be uh, association, and then you can form trajectories out of, uh, out of, of the, uh, this. And you can also merge some of these uh, the diagnoses if you have rare um, uh, diagnoses that you would like to to go. But I, I, um, I would like to go a little bit more detail into a project that just was uh, published in Alzheimer's and, uh, and Dementia, the journal, 
because when we look into the registry and, and look at, at um, dementia diagnosis, most of the diagnoses we find are actually unspecified dementia because the patients have, there's not been no sufficient workup for, for deciding whether it, for example, is Alzheimer or it was vascular dementia. And you see a Venn diagram here, uh, 72,000 unspecified dementia in, 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 in this part of the registry, and then uh, lower numbers for, for Alzheimer and for vascular dementia. So, so we got this idea that we should try to look at the trajectory and see whether we could find some patterns in the Alzheimer guys and the vascular dementia guys and see whether we actually could assign a more specific diagnosis for the unspecified um, uh, dementia. Uh, uh, patients here. And of course, you, could, you can start looking at single diagnosis. For example, if you look uh, at Alzheimer's and, and look at the relative risk just at the single diagnosis level, uh, you, will, you, you cannot really see that. But up in the right corner, you see Down syndrome. This has a, a very high uh, uh, relative risk for, for leading to, to, uh, to, to Alzheimer. Uh, and, and vascular dementia, do you can do the same. And if we do the, the trajectories, this is the Alzheimer uh, uh, trajectory to, um, uh, with, the, with the Alzheimer diagnosis to the right. And you also see that many of these patients, they visit unspecified the other green dot here before they go to, to, uh, to, to Alzheimer's. And, and with vascular dementia, it's a little bit more uh, complicated, but very similar when I flip back and forth here, you, you, you see many of the same cardiovascular diagnosis and so on. So, so what we tried in this work was see whether we could make a prediction approach uh, that would separate the patients. And, um, and uh, we, we had high hopes for this uh, approach and that we actually could impute diagnosis into the registry. But it turned out to be very difficult. And our, our predictive performance was very low. And um, we also took these uh, trajectories and diagnoses and tried to see whether we could, th these are UMAP um, plots, where, where you see the two diagnoses in green and, 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 and red. And, and here the patients are age aligned, so 40 to 50 uh, to the left, and then uh, 59 to 61, and, and, and those just being 70 to, uh, in the third one, in C and in D, those just at, at, at 80. And, and it's, it's not so difficult to separate the early onset guys because these, this is driven by, by Down syndrome. So it's more or less trivial and not, not surprising. But when we come to people 70 and, and 80 years old, we, the trajectories look very similar and we cannot separate. And below, you see some of these diagnoses that actually have predictive value. But, but, but altogether, it, it, it's very low. So the reason why we still got this paper published was that we start looking into the literature for mixed dementia. And that's, of course, interesting that, that, um, uh, that, that more and more diseases are being acknowledged for their mixed etiologies. I mean, diabetes, you can have a little bit of insulin resistance. You can have, get diabetes in, in three other ways. But the problem is that some patients actually have a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And it seems that, that, that this work sort of supports the idea that mixed dementia, where you have the two diagnoses or the two mechanisms on top of each other in the same patients, is much more frequent than, than, than we might have uh, assumed. And actually, in ICD-11, there are now codes for mixed dementia, no, no codes for mixed dementia in, in um, uh, ICD-10. So, so, so this is how we uh, turned a negative result into something positive that actually maybe could point at a, at a mixed etiology situation. So um, um, we also make these trajectories in a, in a sex-specific uh, way. So we can, we can look at, at, at uh, the, the, the registry in 50-50, where we take the females and the males separately. And actually, in precision medicine, we talk so much about making small groups but often we do not focus that much on the largest two subgroups that, that, that actually uh, um, are, are, are present. And in this paper that we published last year, we could show that females systematically get the same diagnosis on, 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 on average 
uh, four years later, when you look across all diagnoses, then females get uh, the same diagnosis um, four years later, later than men. And, and this is, of course, uh, in principle, as a good, uh, it's a good thing because uh, then, then, then females have more disease-free years. But if be it's because the, the, the doctors are not looking for cardiology problems in females as often as in men, then, of course, it's, it's, it's um, um, an, an, um, an, an issue. So you can see some, some diseases, of course, that are very different with breast cancer and asbestosis here. Uh, but for example, we also found a significant difference with HDHD in, in, in terms of, of uh, the uh, age, uh, uh, the, the onset for, for the diagnosis. And it seems that that maybe relates, I mean, uh, girls get it later, uh, that maybe there are different forms of HDHD where, where the, the, the female form is, is milder and, and, and these children are not as irritating for the parents. Uh, as the um, as the young boys and 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 and, and they get into the uh, workup process uh, later, but but that was an interesting um, paper and 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 we actually went across all these ICD-10 chapters and see how how are these directionalities different, and we even identified some where the directionality um, uh, is is reversed female, male, and, and some of it could relate to, to disease etiology, X uh, inactivation, or what, what do I know, uh, but it's a starting point for further analysis, and you can look more into the, the paper. So we just got a, a paper accepted that actually will allow you to make your own disease trajectories, because this is, of course, interesting to listen to somebody like me with a lot of papers and so on, but now you can actually, at this website, um, plug your own diagnosis in. If you like to study uh, Down syndrome, you take Q90 and plug it in, and then you will, you will, you will get the uh, diagnosis out, and you can change the relative risks, and, and you can do a lot of manipulation that might uh, lead you to, to these networks. Unfortunately, the video that, 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 that is behind that, this slide is not uh, running, so you have to do the video yourself by hooking into the... the, the, um, the um, the paper, the paper is not out uh, yet, but it's accepted in Nature Communications and, and, and um, uh, will presumably come out. Uh, here you see, for example, what will come out if you plug in Q, Q90, and then you will see the thickness of the arrow will illustrate how many of these patients will make this jump from one diagnosis to, to the next. And there's a ton of, of information. You can make them gender-specific. There's also a code for deaths. There's actually no code for death in the Danish National Patient Registry, but, but we made an artificial one. So also the, the step to death, you can study, study uh, uh, that. So um, I'm running a little bit out of time. I just want to mention last year, this is from another paper from last uh, year where, that we published on, on, on intensive care patients. One, one thing is to stratify patient trajectories into subgroups, but you can also actively use it in prediction approaches. So uh, in this work here, uh, we, um, uh, we looked at survival of uh, ICU patients, and then we, for, we, we compared uh, the, the values you normally pick up uh, during the first uh, 24 hours of, of uh, admission. You can use those to, to make a survival score, normally called SAPS2. There's also SAPS3, but here we compare to SAPS2. Uh, that's the red to the right side there. But you could also plug for that specific patient the disease history from the last 15 years into the network. And it was quite interesting that when we compared, uh, and of course from the death registry we know when people die, when we compare, a little bit complicated here, but the blue is the SAPS2 scores. The, that's the classical score. But when we take the information just available before admission, we get a slightly better performance. So before we roll the bed into the ICU, we can actually compute a mortality uh, score um, uh, that is better than, than what you normally have after 24 hours when you use the SAP2 to, to, um, score. But of course, the green one is when you put the two scores together. And, and uh, for example, for sepsis patients, if you just look at those to the left, I mean, the, the SAPS2 score is very bad, uh, but the disease history is very powerful. 
So now we are doing a lot of analysis of, of uh, a lot of projects. Uh, we also have projects on cesareans, for example, where <laughs> we like to use the disease history to predict the risk for, for cesareans. You can use this concept because we have the data in Denmark at the, at the individual um, uh, level. And, and um, uh, what you also can do, you can look it up in the paper, is that you, of course, can try to invert the network and interpret the features it's looking for and you can rank the features, a little bit hard to see, but of course the age, for example, is very important for the network. But not only you can rank the features, you can also see which features interact. And, um, and there are some interesting stories in that I will not have time to, to, to go into. So, so disease trajectory work uh, can also be, I'll just give a few slides here, can also be just uh, 72 hours, for example, at, at an ICU. So that's also a longitudinal problem. And in a new paper we published uh, this year, uh, we try to make a risk prediction every hour during admission. And then we actually also explain the network every hour. So the physician will be told which features are now dragging the patient towards survival and which are dragging the patient towards death and then you might intervene or be informed or it might help you in various uh, ways and of course we, we made this with with Anas Perner at, at, at uh, Rishospital in, in Copenhagen so so we had a lot of ICU and also the first author here he's a, a physician at, at that ICU ward in Denmark. So there's a lot of potential for using the trajectories, not only for stratification, but also for some of these decision support systems. So this was essentially what I, I, um, I had. We are studying these trajectories, um, but I didn't talk about a lot of other data. So last slide uh, here. Um, we make these trajectories, various clinical data, and then of course you can, you can add other types of exposures, and you can add genetics, you can add income you can add socioeconomic data and we work with Statistics Denmark on, 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 on that. So here's my group and, and also some of the people uh, involved in, in this work. So um, a little bit fast forward here, but uh, disease trajectory is the basic idea and then looking at progression patterns, not just co-occurrences. Very nice. Thank you very much. Just yeah. We will, uh, we will see, there's probably some questions on Slack. Um, so, um, I posted a question here, which has been a little bit upvoted. This is probably a simple question for someone like you. Um, great talk, San. That's, I wrote that, yeah. How do you combine text mining with quantitative data such as blood values? Yeah, so, so here we are looking at assigned diagnosis, structured data. But in other pieces of work, we actually text mine the diagnosis and the symptoms mm. out of the um, clinical narratives. Uh, and they are, of course, also in some sense time-stamped day mm -hmm. by day. Mm. So we can compute some of these directionalities also from the text mind symptoms or text mind diagnosis codes and mm. they that might be um, in, in many ways better uh, because of course there are some there is some coding bias right i mean uh, these codes generate income right for the yeah. wards yeah. Yeah. Uh, so actually in 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 the clinical narratives uh, there's a little bit more unbiased where one physician tried to communicate to the next what did actually right. uh, go on here and um, and then with the the, um, the lab values, um, you saw, for example, the arrows, uh, how many patients would follow these uh, different directions. But of course, also, you can do the same for lab values, where you, you say this, this arm has a higher cholesterol right. level than, than this yeah. one, or, yeah. or, or lipids, and so on. So, yeah. so it's a little bit more complicated, also because different patients are not getting the same lab tests. Right. And also they are not being tested with the same equipment yeah. because it's phased out at different time points yeah. and one assay will replace another one. Right. But, yeah. but uh, there are various ways of dealing uh, with, with that. But, but and are you then able, have you tested whether or not you're able to end up at a correct diagnosis before the actual diagnosis is made as a way to sort of validate your approach? Is, are you able to? Because sometimes the diagnosis comes later in the 
trajectory yeah, or the... Yeah, uh, we have worked on that, but, but it's actually not what I'm doing here. I'm just trying to see what are the patterns. Yes. I'm not trying to predict the next diagnosis. Right. I'm, I'm in the last thing here. I'm trying to predict when, when the patient will die and yeah. actually the risk of, of, of that. But the predictive approach um, is also something we work on, but it's, it's a different story. Yeah. And, and, and I don't see that success in that as a validation of the stratification yeah. approach because yeah. uh, predicting the di next diagnosis is influenced by so many exposures and right. germline genetics and... Yeah. and uh, the, the reason I'm asking or the, was also when can we replace doctors with uh, my laptop? <laughs> I mean, this is data-driven. <laughs> if, if we had no data from, from, um, uh, from the doctors, then we would be out of business. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying <laughs> or suggesting that we can make uh, sort of a de novo doctor in, 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 in this way. I mean, human physiology and disease patterns are very, very complicated. So I think yeah. we shouldn't uh, exaggerate uh, in that okay. direction. We have some, maybe one more question. We're running a little bit over, but I think that's okay. We have one from Michael Peter, from my group here in the audience. Uh, he's saying, thanks for the interesting talks, Aaron. Um, so that is a two-part question. What is the future of the Danish registry in your work? And will you collect new types of data sets? For example, data from wearables. Yeah, so this is also an excellent uh, question. So, so this was made on, on LPR2. So there's a, something called LPR3 uh, that is a, a more real-time uh, registry. Mm -hmm. Could have been good for many researchers actually to have access to LPR3 during the COVID-19. Right problem where you could study things in, 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 in real time. So actually doing this in a more real time fashion, you would be able to, to, uh, to make decision support mm -hmm. tools in, in, a, in a different way and, and right. actually plug history in from just uh, minutes before you, you, you need to make a treatment decision. Yeah. So, so this is of course what we did with the ICU, but there we have data in a, in, in yeah. a separate database. But right. LPR3 will be a population wide model for having more time true data and this and will be in denmark yes this is not a european is there any european attempts to cross uh, borders with i think the there, there are people working on comparing for example some of these disease core occurrences in, in in different countries and 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 the trends but we should remember that there will be other patterns in spain i see they Eat, eat more olive oil, or uh, they they, they, bacon, they have maybe. some germans. In it. They, there are many different differences. So so uh, so disease trajectory should not just replicate all over because it's also right. related to the structure of the healthcare system. What is covered? What is not covered? And 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 so it's more complicated when you want to okay. compare across yes. countries. Great. I think that we will have to move on. But thank you very much, Sun. It was a yeah. really fantastic talk.